Hello from myself, I'm Nick Stern from the London School of Economics and I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Royal Economic Society who put together this series of seminars. Um, so greetings, greetings to you all wherever, gre greetings to you all wherever you are. The, uh, this is the uh, third in the sub-series that we've organised, Monday of this week, Thursday of this week, and uh, Friday now, is the third of a, a series about a strong and sustainable recovery. So could I have the uh, next slide, please? So this slide sets out the structure of what we're trying to do. Uh, recovering from COVID needs a strong strategy to help drive investment. And on Monday, we discussed the investments and that strategy. Uh, yesterday, we discussed the policies which could draw through those investments. And today, we're talking about the finance, the right kind of finance in the right place at the right time to take these investments uh, forward, get the finance in place so that they can happen. There's an overarching set of um, goals which the UK government has articulated for the coming years, levelling up across the UK, going to net zero by 2050, boosting productivity, uh, refurbishing, investing in the country's infrastructure and building a role as global Britain. So the discussions that we've had and will have are oriented around uh, investments, policies, finance that can take those goals forward. In recognising uh, those goals, there will be a strong emphasis on the sequencing. We are now in rescue, we are moving to uh, recovery. So this is about the design of the recovery. And in doing so, social cohesion, uh, social capital, if you like, will be very important, along with natural capital. And we'll be thinking about investments in all of those things. On uh, Monday, the scale of the crisis was emphasised very strongly. The, uh, this is much bigger than the last one. It's truly global uh, in a way that the 2008-2010 crisis was uh, uh, originating in the financial systems of rich countries. And uh, this one is disrupting uh, economies and life everywhere. We won't bounce back uh, very quickly if we just leave it to uh, the market uh, alone. This is going to take strong policy to bring us back. Uh, we can come back and we're describing the strategy policy and finance uh, that's necessary uh, to do that. We gave examples in the preceding seminars of the kind of thing that could be both sustainable and done very quickly. So we can see now investments that uh, can be done fast, they can uh, be labour intensive and they can have strong multipliers. Think about retrofitting um, buildings, thinking about building cycling and the pedestrian access and facilities better in cities. Think about investing in our natural capital, uh, such as trees, um, land, peatland, um, the water uh, facilities and so on. There's so much that we can do that can bring people back to work quickly, have strong multipliers and be very good for the transition to zero uh, carbon economy and indeed can take place across the country. This is oriented to the UK, but we should emphasize that many of the ideas we hope that we offer here will be uh, much more broadly. So let me, before I hand over, give one or two thank yous. Thank yous to our speakers today, uh, Stephen Jones, uh, Ian Sims and uh, Tim Besley. I'll, uh, be coming in as well, and Rianne Thomas, who will be giving a response. Um, my colleague at the LSE, Nick Robbins, will be moderating the discussion. I'll hand over to him in a moment. Thank you to Gus O'Donnell, Andy Haldane, Claire Lombardelli for all the guidance involved, of course, but then in no way committed officially. This is a Royal Economic Society series, and this sub series organized from the LSE and the Grantham Institute. Thank you to all our speakers and the discussants, thank you to Sam Unsworth for the overall management, Dimitri Zengelis, Anna Valero and Nick Robbins organised the sessions, this one in particular by Nick Robbins. And thank you to Leighton Chipperfield, Chief Executive of the Royal Economic Society, 
and Brad and Julia and others at the Royal Economic Society. And finally, thank you to my fellow presidents of the Royal Economic Society, Tim Besley, Rachel Griffith, Carol Proper. Uh, together, we put all these together for the Royal Economic Society. So let me now hand over to Nick Robbins, please. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, to uh, the, next, the next slide. Thank you very much. And again, uh, I'd like to extend my welcome to you for joining this uh, special sem seminar organized by the Royal Economic Society. Today, our focus is how we can uh, mobilize uh, the UK's financial system behind a strong and sustainable uh, recovery. Um, we'll look at the role of uh, banks, of institutional investors and of public finance. Um, I'll give a few introductory remarks uh, and then be, will be followed by uh, five uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, Stephen Jones from UK Finance, uh, Ian Sim from Impax in Investment Management, uh, Professors Tim Besley and Nick Stern uh, from the London School of Economics, uh, and then uh, Ria Marie Thomas uh, from the Green Finance Institute will also provide uh, a strategic uh, response to the presentations. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of some uh, building blocks, in terms of how we can think uh, of this situation, um, it's uh, clear that the current health and economic crisis uh, caused by the uh, coronavirus um, and uh, the recovery of come is really gonna shape the next phase in the evolution of sustainable finance. A few things to bear in mind, I, I think, as we go through this discussion today. Uh, it's clear that a step change is required uh, in, in the UK. Um, to drive sustainable growth uh, in both the uh, amount and public, of public and private investments, and also in the coherence of policies that lies uh, behind that. Um, it's very clear the impact that the crisis has already had on uh, social systems uh, and uh, human well-being, uh, potentially increasing inequality. Uh, and I think this has really highlighted the need that as we do make this shift uh, to a net zero economy, that this will need to be uh, inclusive. Already, uh, we're seeing a number of, uh, I suppose, assumptions being tested, uh, a few uh, cases uh, to point to, uh, a fast forwarding perhaps of uh, asset stranding in high carbon sectors, notably aviation and oil and gas, uh, a real acceleration of uh, fourth industrial revolution, automation, digital uh, work and so on, and also the beginnings of realization strategies and, and questioning about international supply change. What I think has been striking in these uh, last few weeks and months is really how uh, investors and banks have been actually deepening their commitment uh, to financing climate action, uh, highlighting the importance of, of a just transition this as part of this wider package of a sustainable recovery. Uh, Nick highlighted this earlier, but there's um, really now a very good evidence base of the range of investment options that governments can now take, which really have high potential in terms of the economic multiplier, in terms of immediate job creation, as well as environmental impact. Um, certainly in terms of clean uh, infrastructure, renewables infrastructure, building retrofit, education and training, natural capital, and then clean tech R&D. Next slide, please. So I think the importance is we look across uh, the financial system, the different parts of the financial system, and just five thoughts uh, to pose uh, to you as, as we go through this discussion. First, clearly, is we need to join up uh, real economy priorities and incentives. Many of these, the, re the resilience of our, of our nation as a whole, questions around productivity, investments in infrastructure, innovation and skills, sustainability and net zero goals, uh, leveling up on the just transition, and then clearly issues about the interlinkages between human health and nature conservation, which has been revealed by this crisis. Then we have the opportunity through um, uh, ambitious public action to stimulate private investment. Uh, a fiscal stimulus, which can be job rich and focused on uh, net zero uh, uh, priorities, putting that front and center thinking through the role of central bank operations and the management of climate risk by the Bank of England, also potentially in innovative instruments in the marketplace, such as green sovereign bonds, and then where we need to strengthen our institutional architecture, potentially through a national investment uh, bank. Third priority, I think, is also that this uh, sustainable recovery package can really build on the growing financial sector commitment to sustainability. Uh, there really is a rising importance of the importance of purpose, 
uh, and stewardship in banking investment, as well as real desire, I think, amongst savers to connect their, their savings pots and their pensions plans to long-term sustainability. This will be important, uh, the fourth point, to connect uh, these wider UK frameworks and actions with place-based delivery, particularly strengthening the institutional capacity at the local, the regional, and obviously the devolved government levels, and enabling these, uh, these institutions, these authorities, these, these governments to attract and deploy capital for place-based recovery strategies, thinking particularly about small business, uh, community enterprise, as well as industrial innovation clusters. And finally, we are focusing today on the UK, um, but also I think we need to put this in a context of a global approach, recognising the severe needs um, for capital in emerging and developing countries in the time of crisis uh, and supporting a global response. The UK has a particular opportunity to do this through its uh, presidency of the COP26 Climate Summit next year and also the G7 Group of Nations. And one idea that has come forward uh, from a, a, an alliance of universities is that uh, the UK could launch an intergovernmental sustainable uh, recovery uh, alliance. Those are my introductory uh, remarks. And at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Stephen Jones um, from uh, UK Finance uh, to take over and focus on the role of banking. Next slide, please. Thank you, Nick. Um, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm the Chief Executive of UK Finance. And as such, uh, I represent about 270 financial institutions uh, and their activities in the UK across banking, finance, payments, uh, uh, and the collective um, fight against uh, economic crime uh, that the industry uh, takes forward. Uh, my first slide, please, um, relates to the lessons from the crisis and the recovery phase. Just waiting for that to click through. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and in, in the context of the response so far, clearly uh, the banking industry has been, sorry, could you go back a slide? Um, it, the banking industry has been um, fully engaged in uh, working with regulators and government and policymakers and Whitehall, the, 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 the civil service, in ensuring that there is appropriate uh, support. Could you please go back one slide if you can? Thank you. Um, that support uh, has uh, extended across the retail space with uh, payment holidays for uh, mortgage customers, um, uh, guaranteed free overdrafts uh, in the unsecured credit space, payment holidays for uh, credit cards, vehicle finance installment loans. And in the business sector, um, it has involved working with government in the design and deployment of a range of uh, financing support schemes um, which harness um, the bank's transmission capabilities, um, their risk um, uh, assessment capabilities, uh, as well as the government's risk appetite to ensure that more credit than might otherwise be made available to the corporate sector um, uh, is lent. Uh, and you'll have seen schemes um, bounce back loans, coronavirus business interruption loans, coronavirus larger business interruption loans, uh, and the coronavirus corporate finance facility, um, all of which tackle various segments of the corporate community uh, in making uh, credit available uh, in different forms. And I think that the stage of the crisis that we are at now is very much in terms of the calibration, ensuring the efficient deployment of those schemes, ensuring that those businesses that government intended should receive the financing under those schemes receive that financing and in respect of the consumer agenda um, uh, seeking to align uh, payment holidays with uh, other vital uh, government support measures in particular the job retention scheme uh, and the self-employed income scheme uh, to ensure that um, as many households as possible uh, receive the support that they need um, uh, pending uh, a recovery um, which enables them to return to um, uh, normal in inverted commas uh, work uh, and income. Uh, clearly the banks will have continued roles in ongoing uh, policy design because they continue and will continue to be transmission mechanisms and I would point to the fact that actually even doing what's been done over the last eight weeks has been remarkably complex because the combination of conduct regulation, prudential regulation, 
uh, uh, the, the, the financial ombudsman service that deals with complaints, the lending standards boards that regulates the standards associated with lending and pieces of legislation like the Consumer Credit Act has meant that what may seem like a simple deployment, a loan of up to £50,000 on a largely self-certified basis to smallest, the smallest of businesses, including sole traders, is not as simple uh, as it seems and has involved uh, significant regulatory change uh, and the need for the industry to accept that there will be retrospective statutory change as well uh, coming through in order to ensure that what it is doing today and what it will be required to do in the future, uh, in particular in terms of how it treats um, uh, customers in default uh, under the debt that they've taken on under these various schemes um, is, um, is appropriate uh, and is legal. Clearly the legacy of the crisis policy choices um, will be many, but from a banking sector perspective, um, the critical legacy will be of um, indebtedness, uh, indebtedness of consumers as they roll up payments that they would otherwise be making, resulting in the need to resume uh, payments um, at affordable levels, but nevertheless at levels which uh, all other things being equal will be higher than they were making going into the crisis. Uh, and for businesses, a legacy of significant and probably excessive debt uh, across the whole uh, corporate uh, value chain. Um, the, um, the, the protection of consumers and the protection of businesses, uh, as we unwind uh, some of these extraordinary measures will be incredibly difficult uh, and incredibly important. And obviously there will be significant long-term uh, impacts on the dynamics um, of the banking market, both for consumers and for businesses that result from this. From a normalization perspective, clearly a lot of in-flight uh, regulatory change has been suspended uh, in order to enable the operationalization of the uh, extensive support that is now being offered. Uh, and the pace at which that uh, regulation is reintroduced and, and frankly, the appropriateness of what in a pre-crisis world looked appropriate of some of those regulatory changes will need to be considered in the light of the uh, economy uh, and societal uh, considerations that will be relevant as we um, you know, emerge uh, and we have better uh, um, visibility in terms of how our environment has changed, how business has changed, how the financial balance sheet of the consumer economy has changed. Uh, and clearly there will be considerations for corporates, but banks and non-banks uh, regarding um, um, measures that they've taken to suspend distribution to equity providers uh, during the crisis and the pace at which that should be uh, reintroduced uh, alongside um, 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 uh, the, the revival of the economy and the need to continue to lend to support the economy. So from a consolidated crisis learning perspective, um, I think there'll be many things uh, that will come through. I think the shape of banking will change. The use of cash has changed. Um, uh, how we pay, where we work, um, how we serve customers, um, uh, you know, has already reset and will not return to um, the way it existed previously. Uh, and, and many of those changes offer opportunities. Next slide, please. So how can banks support a strong and sustainable recovery um, across the customer groups and regions? Um, as I've mentioned, uh, debt will be the big overhang and how we deal with that debt, how we man manage it, both in the public and private sectors, um, um, will be absolutely critical to the uh, shape of the economy that emerges. But with that debt comes the opportunity um, to, to, to reset the way that we think about business uh, and in the context of any relief packages that emerge for over indebted consumers and businesses comes the opportunity to set conditions uh, which allow us to do things differently to the way that they were done before. And I'm conscious of the Ipsos Mori poll last month that notwithstanding the COVID-19 crisis, two thirds of Britain believe that climate change is as serious as COVID-19 and a majority want the climate prioritized in the economic recovery. So I've talked about the unwinding of payment holidays for consumers. In the context of businesses, there will be a range of instruments that required and a range of contributors required in order to facilitate debt for equity swaps. And given that the public sector will need to be involved in that recapitalization of business that will inevitably emerge, 
um, I think the opportunity for the conditionality attached to that recapitalization to be heavily um, um, uh, incentivized by uh, green and sustainable uh, factors um, is real and one that we should all be encouraging and pushing. Uh, and from a risk perspective, um, um, I just encourage everybody on this call to recognize that when we look back at some of the schemes that have been put in place, bear in mind the pace at which they've been put in place, the suspension uh, of normal checks uh, and balances, uh, particularly in the lending process, and obviously uh, the fact that affordability um, has been very, very difficult for banks to assess, and, and in many cases they have had to suspend uh, normal um, uh, risk judgments around affordability in order to ensure that credit flows. That was the intent, that was what government wanted, that was what society wanted, uh, and I hope that the banks uh, in the course of public opinion are not punished uh, for lending in the way that they are currently lending in order to support this uh, economy through these extraordinary times. Uh, the next slide, please. So the policy framework that will enable um, uh, us to uh, move forward in the recovery phase, clearly from a public perspective, infrastructure skills, innovation, that should all go through, in our view, a climate action lens. Uh, market pricing, um, renewables, um, are now um, a clearly uh, critical and, 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 and uh, economic choice and a viable economic choice. Um, and I would suggest that we need to recognize that gas is part of the transition um, because hydrogen-based uh, technology is still some way away. From a monetary policy perspective, um, it's possible that the uh, public sector, the Bank of England could be thinking about greening its central bank asset purchase programs and liquidity support programs. And from a financial regulation perspective, um, we're already very heavily uh, engaged in and supportive of TCFD disclosures, uh, climate-based stress tests and scenarios. Um, uh, the ESG expectations of pension funds are increasingly crystal clear. Uh, and obviously the way that Solvency II or MIFID uh, is advanced, um, we now have an opportunity, I think, to, to, to reflect on green and sustainable goals at the heart of those um, critical pieces of, of um, uh, of regulation. I come back to public finance um, crowding in private capital uh, as a critical part of, of hey, recapital. Uh, Nick Stern here, we're, we're running a bit tight on time. So. Okay, I'll finish up uh, uh, as being a critical tool that we can do. And so the critical risks and breakthrough opportunities on the next slide. Um, institutional investors, greater accountability through um, uh, uh, holding businesses and banks to account for TCFD related disclosure real assets, infrastructure investment, um, being uh, having sustainability uh, at the core of the infrastructure decisions that are taken and the financing that is provided to support those infrastructure uh, investments. Customer support. Um, we need to bring our customers with us on a green journey. We need to be providing them with choices to invest and save in a green way. Uh, and, but we need to recognize that we will be doing so in the short term against an environment uh, of uh, excessive uh, consumer debt. Uh, and that's a real challenge in the context of greening of housing stock. And then finally, the global leadership of the UK. Uh, I think there's a very real opportunity for the banking and finance sector and the regulatory system around it to establish itself as a world leader in this space. So at that point, I'd like to hand over to Ian Sims. Thanks, Stephen. Just clicking the uh, video on button on my computer. So um, Impact Asset Management has been investing in the sustainable economy for over 20 years. So that's the context of my remarks. This webinar series has, I think, quite rightly focused on build back better as a, um, a metric for what we're trying to achieve. I'd like to suggest that actually before the COVID crisis, we had a challenge on our hands to establish a net zero economy by 2050. And so it's perhaps another, another metaphor, which will be something along the lines of create and construct cleaner. If I could have the, um, the next slide and the one after that. What I'd like to do is, um, is give a few um, opening remarks at a high level and then dive into the detail subsequently. The slides are taking a bit of time, but let me, um, let me get started. The, <clears throat> I think the challenge with um, net zero is is one of a 30-year um, program. So 30 years is a long time in the context of 
product life cycle, but it's not very much time in the context of uh, returns from infrastructure. So we definitely need to get on with it. So um, I think in that, in that context, then it's very important that we, we focus on um, delivering a, a system which is um, robust from the perspective of a, um, a marketplace which is relying on Uh, Ian, I think if you could keep going, um, there seems to be, here we go. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so we've got 30 years, but we need to get on with it. Um, I think it's really important that the three constituencies lock arms. We need to jump together as government, business and investors. There is a little bit of a worrying trend in which uh, investors are putting pressure on international companies to commit to net zero without international policy commitment. And if that's taken to, to its extreme, there could be a significant uh, destruction of value for, for savers. We're not starting from scratch. UK has led the world for over 30 years in showing that sustainable development does work in practice. We need to learn the lessons, what does and what doesn't work, and we do need to go faster. And of course, as Nick uh, Robbins has already mentioned, COP26 is a great opportunity for just to showcase our expertise and, um, and really lead by example. Investors are really reliant on a resilient system and that's been demonstrated by COVID-19. Investors are dependent on there being a strong public health system, on there being a vibrant science and research base, and um, the ability to have a constructive dialogue with government around emergency support. Delivering net zero will certainly create opportunities, but of course there will be losers in sunset industries. And uh, this is not a political statement, it's just sound economics that we need to be careful about targeting training and shoring up investment in infrastructure in areas that, uh, that may be left behind or communities that might get left behind. Financial market regulators, I think, are rightly putting pressure on the financial system to um, strengthen diversity and inclusion in our, in our work. This is also not politics as far as I'm concerned, it's really very sound uh, economics and management, that resilience is stronger, is better if there are diverse views. And so we really need to encourage that in our institutions. And then of course, the, the obvious but often overlooked point is that by and large investors are not uh, wealthy individuals sitting in remote tax havens. They're actually you and me and our friends and family and the man and woman in the street, because most money comes from pension funds and savings products. And therefore we all have a very strong interest in aligning the um, the pension plan and savings products with long-term investment, both opportunity and risk management. Can I have the next slide, please? So there is a great opportunity here to focus the recovery on sustainable development, as we've heard. Over the last 10 years, if you'd invested in a environmental index like a FTSE uh, Russell index, you'd have made about 25% more profit than if you just invested in the, the wider market. So you can make better risk-adjusted returns by going green. And that's certainly been proven in the the recent uh, two or three months in the financial um, downdraft of, of the COVID-19 crisis where sustainable development funds have outperformed. This opportunity to align finance and climate um, policy is, is um, enormously exciting, of course. So I think my central point of my, my whole talk here is that if we're going to deliver net zero, we need to cascade that down through sectoral roadmaps that together add up to a result for, <coughs> for net zero and each has got um, a policy trajectory requirement. Investors are looking for clarity around uh, clean energy developments. Some of these are easy, for example, renewable power generation, some less straightforward, for example, EV charging networks, and some are really quite difficult, like hydrogen infrastructure. The UK's experience with offshore wind developments over 20 years of partnership between government, industry and finance is a very good example. And of course, there's enormous benefits for everybody. Can I have the next slide, please? So this, the next slide talks about some of the detail here. Um, we're going to need more information with companies. The TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure is a timely catalyst for this. However, we need to remember that, that data and information costs companies to collect and process it. There is a risk if we just ask for everything that we drown in data. And so we need a real focus on what is decision useful when we're asking for data. Green taxonomies are helpful and actually impacts uh, designed one of the world's first green taxonomies over 20 years ago. Um, but green is not black and white. There are trade-offs, for example, around the pollution coming from manufacturing clean energy equipment. Science and technology does evolve and therefore green does evolve. And if government takes charge of taxonomies, there is a risk that politics gets in the way and makes the whole thing um, uh, suboptimal. And so there is an alternative vision 
in which the private sector provides choice in uh, taxonomies with highly trusted intermediaries. There's an opportunity here to, to really crowd in much more expertise to um, unlock our green transition. The LGPS pooling system has been successful in bringing in more resources to the pension funds uh, sector, but the UK is still woefully fragmented in this area and we need to find ways of uh, perhaps encouraging more consolidation or partnerships to bring in more expertise. And the final point on this slide, of course, is that asset owners and asset managers are very keen on exploiting uh, long-term investment opportunities. So regulation post COVID-19 and the sad demise of Neil Woodford's business should really ensure that it doesn't deter long-term investment, particularly in illiquid assets. And I'd like to give a shout out in particular to the UK closed end company market, which leads the world, particularly in investment trusts, in pooling capital in permanent capital type vehicles. Next slide, please. So it's actually my final slide. Um, I think just two key points here. The transition to a low carbon, zero carbon economy can be a uh, benefit across the whole country. Renewable energy is inherently a local activity. Biomass, wind, tidal and solar, there's much more potential uh, outside uh, the southeast than there is in the southeast. The escape from the common agricultural policy gives, uh, through the agriculture bill, opportunities in environmental land management to really be creative about how to create value, for example, carbon sinks. Transportation buildings, a lot of scope to, uh, to, to be radical here. And a couple of barriers to just point out. Firstly, local government capabilities, they, they need to be strengthened. We need more resources. And I think as we're about to hear, the case for a national invest, investment bank is very strong. So just in summary, uh, three points. I think government, business and, and finance needs to team up to, to uh, jump together. This is a, requires a collaboration. Investment um, is our money, so we need to make sure that our interests are being taken account of when, uh, when the investment industry is being brought into this debate. And finally, there's a huge opportunity here to engage, mo motivate and bring value for the whole of the UK. And at that point, I'm going to hand over to, to Tim and to Nick. Okay, so if I could get the, uh, the next slide, please. Um, so I should begin with a disclaimer. I'm speaking today in a personal capacity, not as a member of the National Infrastructure Commission. Um, and when it comes to the topic today, it's a case of plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, in the sense that we were all before the COVID-19 crisis, very concerned about uh, the need to invest in infrastructure. Uh, and and the, the National Infrastructure Commission uh, wrote uh, the, a national infrastructure assessment as to, to define a set of guiding principles. And we were waiting on the Treasury to respond to that. And very understandably, because of the crisis, that, that hasn't happened. Um, there are three core challenges that infrastructure um, uh, um, should support. One is, of course, the post-Brexit world. Um, and in particular, the loss of access to the European Investment Bank is relevant in the context of our discussion today. The second, of, of, of course, is the net zero challenge, which has been mentioned many times, and, and Nick will also uh, pick up on, I'm sure. And the third is leveling up, the need to uh, um, achieve a, a, a more even level of economic development around the UK. All that sits, of course, in the context of a wider productivity challenge uh, and uh, to which infrastructure can play a role. It, it's, it has to work alongside many other interventions, um, but uh, infrastructure has a key role to play in that productivity challenge. When the LSE Growth Commission uh, issued its first report, we said that we thought there needed to be a new institutional architecture for infrastructure, which had three pillars. One, of course, very centrally is, is government. Uh, and uh, uh, which plays an important role in coordinating and spending on infrastructure. Uh, the second is, uh, which was uh, created by George Osborne, is the National Infrastructure Commission to provide that strategic guidance. And the third, which we recommended, was the creation of a development bank or an investment bank to carry that through. Um, Post-crisis, uh, we think these challenges are magnified uh, because of the situation we'll be in when we pull out of the, uh, of the, the worst of the COVID crisis. Could I have the next uh, slide, please? So 
the plan of government prior to the crisis was to spend 1.2% on GDP, and we were awaiting fresh guidance before the crisis on whether that might be increased. Um, and we were awaiting, as I said, the national infrastructure strategy to describe just what the priorities would look like for government uh, over the, the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, the ambition now is, of course, to build back better, and that suggests we would want to, if anything, increase the, that ambition. Um, the EU is around 2%, but we should be a little careful comparing the UK with the rest of the EU because we have, on top of that 1.2% spending by government, we have a very significant infrastructure spend in private hands, which suggests we're somewhat less of an outlier than that number might initially suggest. Um, the, the, uh, unlike the earlier presentations, I would, I would say that our presentation is very much a, a call to arms, though, in uh, arguing for the case again, if you like, for a, a national uh, investment bank to support this. And why? Well, we think that's part of, a, of the right institutional framework, as we, as we argued previously, that recognizes the centrality of political risk. Um, that can create the kind of long-term commitments that you need across electoral cycles and also can bring the cost of finance down and, and additionally crowding in private investment. Uh, and those arguments we think are particularly powerful at the current juncture and should guide uh, the principles, uh, the principled argument for setting up such a bank. And I'm now going to hand over to Nick, who's going to give a clearer sense uh, of how we think such a bank could be structured to add value. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, what would this uh, National Investment Bank bring to the table? Well, first, it can help bring forward and uh, it can help. Uh, can it, I hope you can hear me. I'm getting funny signal on, uh, on my screen, but uh, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Um, what would such a bank uh, do? Well, it can help bring forward um, projects uh, at scale. It can help bring people together around complicated projects. Think of uh, rooftop solar, where you've got to get a lot of people together, a lot of agents and actors together. So this kind of bank can be very helpful in doing that. Second, it can overcome crucial market failures. We know that uh, early stage infrastructure, for example, can be very risky. It can be quite difficult to get private capital markets to take on that risk. They also have to worry about government-induced uh, policy risk they may not be able to look sufficiently far ahead. Well, the National Investment Bank can overcome those market failures. It has the strengths to overcome those market failures, and these strengths, I think, are, are fundamental. Let me describe them uh, very quickly. Its presence itself reduces policy risk. Governments are less likely to mess about in the presence of a National Investment Bank involvement. It can take a very long-term view, can have a full range of instruments, equity, long-term loans, political risk guarantees, mezzanines, and so on, to manage that risk. It can get people together. It can be a really good convener for syndicating, sharing those finances, uh, sharing the financial uh, needs and challenges. So it has fundamental strengths from the way it's put together. And that means it can help take projects through those difficult early stages. And once it's done that, it can sell on its loans or sell on its equity and it can make money. I experienced that directly when I was chief economist at EBRD. You really could take it through the early stages and, uh, and make some money. It helps with government transparency. Some of these decisions should not get lost inside ministries, which would make them much less transparent. So by being a public body uh, accountable to Parliament, it can really show what uh, uh, it is doing and why, it's done, why it was doing those things. And finally, it can collaborate very well with the retail banks. Think of building retrofitting, insulating, taking out gas boilers. Those collaborations, I think, will be uh, very uh, important. And finally, it can work alongside the British Business Bank. That's oriented towards 
SME. So it's a different function and different set of financial skills, but they can be highly complementary. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, how would it actually do its job? Well, it's got to have a clear mandate, uh, Articles Association. Uh, it will have it, uh, people it can lend to, private, national, and local government. So the mandate would indicate its overall long-term objectives, which are beyond, of course, short-run private, short-run uh, profit maximization. But on the other hand, it must operate under sound banking principles. It must uh, use its strengths to be additional, and it must push forward the national strategy goals. And because it's got the underlying institutional strength I described, it can do all those three things. I sat every Friday morning for six years on the um, operations committee of the EBRD, and that's exactly the kind of thing we pursued, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Those operating principles would be applied, should be applied transparently and rigorously, and they're clearly understandable, and the staff is accountable to the board for doing that. The board itself should have um, the right kind of skills as well as civil society members. Last slide, please. How could it actually be financed? Well, here we call on the genius of Keynes who came up with the idea of paid in capital and callable capital. You pay in, uh, here the example is 20 billion and 80 billion has to stand by, the government has to be ready to put it in. So there's 100 billion in principle of total capital. And then um, of course you can pay in the capital over five years, say at 4 billion, um, per annum. If you can have a 1.5 to 1 gearing ratio, then that means that you could, in principle, have outstanding uh, book uh, uh, of 150 billion. So you could lend uh, 30 billion a year for five, uh, you could lend 30 billion a year, and if they turn over every five years, you stay within your um, overall 150 billion limit. If you share with the private sector, that can take to 60 billion. Uh, in other words, you, some of the projects would be joint with uh, the private sector. Some of the projects would be all private sector. So uh, what you could do is have a total project value of around 60 billion pounds per annum. And that is over the two plus percent in GDP that we might be looking for. So it could be a really substantial scale. And uh, if it, uh, as I said earlier, if you turn over your investments and you invest wisely, then you should be profitable. And the uh, strong examples of exactly that kind of profitability, International Finance Corporation, EBRD, and so on. And it would be a good idea to think of bringing in the private sector as well. So this is an idea whose uh, time has come. The arguments were very powerful before COVID. In my view, they're now absolutely overwhelming in a world of battered confidence, strained li liquidity, and unemployed resources. I personally have worked to set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, been involved with the Green Investment Bank establishment and the re-establishment of the EBRD. We really can do these things quickly. Now is the time to get on with a national investment bank. Now over to Rianne, please. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the Royal Economic Society for the opportunity to respond with a few comments. I hope you can see me. Uh, clearly a lot to comment on. And let me start by picking up on the National Investment Bank proposal, uh, which we at the Green Finance Institute wholeheartedly support. A key purpose of such an institution would be to deliver additionality to the green finance market, supporting the crowding in of private capital towards a resilient economy in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. As a former banker, I'd like to highlight five proposed activities that could be undertaken by such an institution to achieve that particular aim. The first one, as touched on by Lord Stone, would be addressing the technology and early deployment risks, both through supporting individual transactions, but importantly, by also building familiarity within the financial sector by financing multiple deals in new innovative areas. The Green Investment Bank's role in supporting offshore wind, as Ian mentioned, is a really powerful case study here. And I think it's worth elaborating on that for a moment, if I may. 
uh, whilst the Green Investment Bank overcame the investment gap, it did so in conjunction with other significant measures that were put in place by policymakers in order to rapidly develop the offshore wind industry. Specifically, the financial incentives that came in the form of contracts of difference that were put in place to lower the high investment hurdle rates faced by project developers and investors. The alignment of seabed leasing processes and the structured bidding rounds that were established for access and construction permissions. And the competitive bidding rounds to auction available offshore wind capacity that were launched in order to highlight the investment opportunity. In summary, breaking down that case study into a potentially replicable blueprint, it involved identifying untapped high potential technologies, targeting barriers with specific policy instruments, indicating future market demand, in this case for offshore wind, and providing key institutional support in the form of a dedicated investment institution. So returning to the five points I originally mentioned as to how the new institution could support the financing of the zero carbon economy, in addition to absorbing early stage tech risk and familiarizing the market with new areas of innovation. The second point would be around addressing construction risk, construction risk for large complex projects that are less attractive to the private sector, providing long-term finance and liquidity, that again is really challenging for the private sector due to capital constraints or concerns about economic conditions. Fourthly, financing projects where the case for a social return is greater than a purely financial return. Examples, as we've already heard, would be projects that achieve welfare objectives, such as social housing, coastal defences, or retrofitting the building stock to achieve energy efficiency and low carbon heating. The latter a particular area of focus for the Green Finance Institute Coalition on Energy Efficient Buildings, if you'll excuse the blatant advertorial. Um, and finally, by aggregating projects and portfolios, the bank could develop innovative financing structures, which could then mobilize institutional investment towards smaller local projects and solutions. So in designing the bank and, ex and executing against these five points, there's clearly the opportunity to promote many of the ideas that were being put forward by the other panelists today. In particular, the point made by Ian around the importance of sectoral roadmaps or pathways. A differentiated approach by sector is key to identify specific barriers to the mobilization of capital and to overcome them through financial innovation and policy support. The need for investments to address local place-based solutions that Nick Robbins touched on. Ultimately, decarbonisation is a granular, ground-up investment challenge for which there is sadly no green bullet. And also the important point made repeatedly that in the aftermath of COVID, there is a need for closer integration of environmental and social outcomes. Fortunately, the pathways to a zero carbon future are also the pathways to future economic prosperity. The climate narrative needs to be even more firmly rooted now, more than ever, in the opportunity it presents for job creation, health and well-being. More robust measurement of social impact alongside climate action is a key next step in the evolution of the green and sustainable finance market. And finally, I'd like to repeat a call which I hope Stephen made in his remarks about the need for a UK green sovereign issuance some of which could possibly be invested in seed capital in the National Investment Bank, but all of which should be invested not only in infrastructure and R&D, but also in retraining, education and community programmes. Here's a real opportunity for the UK to demonstrate the ingenuity and creativity of UK financial services, working in partnership with government, with industry and with the broader community to develop an innovative Green Guilt Plus framework to address both the pathways to net zero and the social challenges that have sadly been laid bare by the coronavirus pandemic. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Nick Robin. Thank you very much, Ria Marie, for, for closing off that fantastic uh, set, set of uh, presentations. Um, a lot of linkages between them. Um, we've had a number of really good questions. I'd like to start, if I may, 
um, by picking up uh, the call to action from Tim Besley and Nick Stern about the National Investment Bank. Um, Rian, you've also already given some really interesting sort of um, supplementary ideas about the role of the National Investment Bank. Um, could I come to you, uh, Stephen Jones, and then uh, Ian Sim? You both touched on this, but it'd be what I'd be really interested to get your thoughts and reflections and what you've heard so far about how we do make this National Investment Bank um, operational and also very clearly uh, working um, very closely with the um, private finance uh, sector. So maybe Stephen, if I could come to you on that. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. And yes, thank you to all the other panelists for excellent remarks. And sorry, Rian Marie, I was going to talk about a green sovereign bond, but I was uh, running out of time and I was uh, having lots of people telling me that uh, I needed to stop. So yes, the green sovereign bond, we are completely supportive of and totally agree with the importance of that, not just from a signaling perspective, but from a substance perspective and in terms of the development of a, um, a, a vibrant green uh, financing capital market. In terms of the National Investment Bank, um, we are wholly, wholly supportive Nick um, uh, uh, of this um, I think it's an absolutely critical um, uh, need and it's a very urgent critical need possibly on a scale even larger than um, Lord Stern uh, was suggesting uh, in his um, slides which I suspect were uh, slides reflecting an economic model that might have um, been appropriate in pre-crisis times and I, I, here's why um, our current sizing that we're doing of the extent of corporate over indebtedness emerging from this crisis uh, indicates possibly a need of up to 150 billion pounds of new capital from the smallest um, uh, uh, up to the mid-sized businesses. Now that's a very, very significant need. It's a need uh, that those corporates will experience quite quickly uh, as the economy recovers, assuming it recovers more slowly and not in the V-shape that perhaps the, the, the most optimistic are suggesting. Uh, and in that context, the mechanisms uh, to deploy uh, incremental capital, um, the, the, the public sector seeding uh, of that um, uh, co-investment um, that, that, that public sector capital um, will uh, catalyze is really absolutely critical. Uh, it needs to be um, regional uh, as well as national. It needs to be sectoral in the way that all of the speakers have outlined. Uh, and it needs an awful lot of human resource as well, because the scale that we are, dis uh, that, that we are facing uh, in terms of that urgent need for capital uh, is immense in my view. There is a, a working group already looking at this in which we're involved, chaired by Adrian Montague and involving representatives across the private sector at the moment reporting to uh, Andrew Bailey and the Treasury. Uh, this is a real opportunity, this crisis, for us to accelerate and be more ambitious than we might ever have been uh, in the context of the National Investment Bank. And if I can give you one little example in terms of what the sector, the banking sector was required to do in order to get the bounce back loans uh, up and running, uh, eight billion pounds of which have been deployed in loans of up to 50,000 pounds to over 300,000 SMEs in the first six business days of operation. The complexity of the private sector doing that because of our regulatory structures was such that a lot of the risk which is operational uh, and which is follow-up risk as well in terms of supporting those businesses um, has been felt in the need for regulatory and legislative change which I described earlier. If we had KFW in the UK then we would have been able to do Schnell Credit which is what Germany has done where actually the KFW is the lender and it can do things in a way that the private sector is not allowed by the legal and regulatory system to do things and it can do it at speed. KFW is the lender using the banking system as their agents to make those loans, but we do not have that capability uh, in the UK. Lord Stern mentioned the British Business Bank as being a good SME partner. They are tiny, absolutely tiny. They have no regional capability. Uh, they've been working phenomenally hard with us over the last eight weeks to get these schemes up and running. But the difference between uh, the British Business Bank and, and KFW is vast. Uh, and frankly, the need is urgent. I think I'll stop there, Nick. Very good, Stephen. I think actually that very good to put that as a sense of scale, actually. Um, um, Ian, anything to add, particularly on the National Investment Bank? Um, yeah, let me let me add three things, Nick. So I think um, just building on, on what Stephen said, I would fully agree that the British Business Bank is is at small scale, but I think it's much better to build on something that's existing and grow it um, from that existing base rather than start again. Um, I'd certainly give a shout out to the Green Finance Institute as well. I think um, that team 
I mean, embarrassing memories done an excellent job with a very small budget but there's a great uh, opportunity to build build on on them as well second point i make is around strategy i think it's really important looking at the experience of the green investment bank that any national investment bank really is very clear about where it's adding um, to in context of additionality and where it's in need of, of more clarity around policy um, the green investment bank was very successful in one area but but was less successful in the three other areas it was targeting so we need to get the sort of strategic priorities right and i think the third point i'd make is that um, just doing a national investment bank by itself is not enough we really need to strengthen local governments and we've seen from the experience of the treasury task force partnerships uk infrastructure uk that you really need to get um, national and regional local governments to uh, work together with any finance institution so we need to put resources into that area as well Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, uh, Tim and uh, Nick, if I could come to, to you. Uh, we've had a sort of particular question, um, and maybe if you wanted to reflect on what we've already just heard on the comments around the National Investment Bank, but particularly as we go into designing this sustainable recovery, how do you ensure uh, that the government is not being swayed by uh, lobbying from sectors? Um, uh, how and how do we ensure the sort of political economy of this sort of design of the sustainable recovery uh, package? So, Nick and uh, Tim, over to you. I don't know which ones of you would like to pick up that. Can I go first, Tim? Is that? Yeah, go, go ahead, Nick. And then we, we probably have to close right after this. <laughs> it has to be uh, very, um, very brief. I, I think the um, uh, criteria that the government set out as its uh, overall targets, which we took for this uh, whole series of seminar of you know, leveling up net zero productivity infrastructure global britain those are the right kind of criteria to hold to account to uh on the direction of policy the direction of change to avoid i think if you have the criteria clear that helps you avoid uh, the problems of uh, special lobbying but they will always be there and you have to uh, stand up to them i do think that the transparency of a national investment bank can also be very helpful there I should say I'm with um, Stephen Jones and Ian Sim on the size. The figures I gave were purely illustrative. You know, multiply by three, and it could be participating in investments of about 180 uh, billion a year. And that would be absolutely fine. And to get that going, the government would have to put in on the model that we described only around um, 12 billion a year for five years. I say only, but it's small relative to the kinds of challenges that uh, we face. So I'd be very uh, happy to go along with that. It's easy to multiply up the slide that I offer. Tim. Yeah, well, let me just say I, I share um, with, with, with Nick, uh, Ian and Stephen the idea that we could scale this up uh, to an even higher level. But just a, a word on, on the governance. I mean, governance is extremely important in the context of designing an institution like this. Um, but I think in a UK context with sufficient forethought, uh, there really is, it's not a barrier to, to, to doing something both at the right scale and with the right mission to, to deliver. So I fear it could sometimes be used as a sort of, by those who are not favorable towards this, to believe this is an Achilles heel. I think we've seen enough experience around the world in government structures working well in similar institutions to know what to look out for. So I. I personally don't think that should be held as a serious reservation against uh, creating an institution like this. Um, Nick, I, I think I'm going to have to close now because we're right up against uh, our hour. Um, we've tried through the course of these three seminars to set out investments and strategies that are necessary in the bounce back, the policies that can drive it, and today, the finance story. I think if you put it all together, there's a very clear strategy, but we have to be very strong and we have to push very hard and we have to do it very quickly. We can see what to do in terms of investment, we can see the policies to draw through that investment and we can see the uh, finance. The bounce back will not happen strongly enough by itself but we can see what we have to do to make it happen and we can see the sustainable story is very powerful but the most arguably the most powerful way of bouncing back and we really do want to create the jobs of the future not the jobs of the past. The jobs of the past are insecure. They will, those kinds of investments will strand assets and stranded assets are stranded jobs. So let me close by thanking the speakers today. I learned enormously, apologies to the speakers that we had a bit of trouble 
with the slides. Thank you, Leighton, for stepping in and sorting that out. There was a crash somewhere on somebody's internet. But thank you very much to all our speakers for very clear, strong statements, uh, enormously productive. Thank you to um, the uh, discussants and speakers right the way through the series. Thank you to all those who were involved in the organization. And thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.